morning, and welcome to this Sunshine Week event sponsored by Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington and George Washington University Law <coughs> Professor Alan Morrison. Public debate over the use of torture on detainees was severely hampered when the Bush administration refused to disclose the highly controversial analyses done by the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, which concluded that torture was consistent with US laws and treaty obligations. Although the OLC torture memos addressed fundamental questions of national policy, they were off limits to the public until President Obama ordered their release in April of 2009. Today, we face a similar controversy over the refusal of the Obama administration to publicly release OLC opinions that authorized the killing of Americans on foreign soil suspected of terrorism. The public outcry over this practice is no less substantial than the outcry over the torture of detainees. By depriving the public of the rationale for these controversial practices, the administration is following a disturbing trend toward more secrecy and less accountability. That is why we thought it appropriate to look at this subject in more depth as part of our observation of Sunshine Week. Toward that end, we have two terrific panels. The first, made up of a journalist and two lawyers who are litigating over access to OLC opinions. And the second, made up of a former head of OLC and two noted constitutional scholars. And they will be introduced individually in a short while. But first, we are extraordinarily honored to hear from the Honorable Ron Wyden, the Democratic Senator from Oregon. A graduate of Stanford University and the University of Oregon School of Law, Senator Wyden served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1981 until his election to the Senate in 1996. He has been a courageous leader in Congress in the fight against government secrecy. Unafraid to take controversial and at times unpopular positions, Senator Wyden has condemned the national security community's abuses of secrecy and forced the declassification of the CIA Inspector General's 9-11 report. He has shut down the controversial Total Information Awareness Program and spotlighted the reliance by both the Bush and Obama administrations on secret law. I commend to you the letter Senator o Wyden co-authored asking President Obama to direct the Justice Department to provide Congress with all legal opinions that explain the executive branch's understanding of the, of the authority the President has to deliberately kill American citizens. Senator Lott Wyden followed up with a similar letter to the Attorney General in which he elegantly stated, the only way to keep the terrible mistakes of the past from being repeated is to have executive branch officials continually resist the temptation to rely on secret law and for Congress and the public to continually insist on greater transparency. I can think of no greater honor than to have Senator Wyden kick off, off our Sunshine Week event. As a champion of government transparency and accountability, he embodies the values many of us spend our waking hours working towards. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Senator Ron Wyden. What an inflationary introduction. And thank you so, so much. I think it was great to, to be here for this Sunshine Week event, uh, crew and GW and Alan uh, Morrison. What you should know, I'm going to make some news here. Where is Bruce Fine? I don't know how many of you are aware of the great work Bruce has done in the privacy area and uh, having been a voice for individual liberty. But I want to say for the first time publicly in Washington, D.C., that Bruce and I met first when we played basketball one on one all summer long in Palo Alto, California. And suffice it to say that Bruce, who has brought great discipline to the whole area of liberty and scholarship, clearly showed that as well on the basketball court as, uh, as well. I'll tell other stories about basketball if I'm given a chance. Bruce doesn't even know the story. But you know, recently there was discussion about uh, 
Jeremy Lin getting his own bathroom in Palo Alto because everybody played <coughs> basketball at this one, you know, one court, and it was going to be called the Lin Lu. And <laughs> people wrote in and said Ron Wyden ought to be able to get his own bathroom as well because he played basketball as well. And then there was considerable debate, which was usually which really was resolved by saying Ron Wyden is okay as a United States Senator, but he doesn't deserve his own bathroom <laughs> of American politics. So um, let me use this as a time to sort of walk you back a little bit through where we have been in this whole kind of uh, saga, because I think we all understand that American you know, lawmaking under sort of any calculus is cumbersome and it's frustrating. One of my colleagues says that it is the ultimate slow burn to watch this whole question of passing you know, laws. But at the same time, this process, if you look back you know, over uh, history, is also a pretty good way to ensure that the laws have the support of most Americans because they usually don't get passed unless you have people brought into the dialogue and brought in to the discussion. That's, in my view, what legislating is all about in our unique system of government. Having said that, what has been the issue, I think, that has joined us, particularly in this meeting about you know, Sunshine Week, is that process that I've described can break down and break down in a hurry if our laws, which are public, are secretly reinterpreted behind closed doors by a small number of government officials without public scrutiny or without debate. And when that kind of thing you know, happens, you are more likely to end up with the government interpreting the law in ways that the American people will be, uh, in many instances, reluctant to accept. So let me kind of use that as a kind of backdrop for this discussion to then say that I have long argued as part of this discussion that we have been having for a number of years now that there are certainly legitimate reasons for government agencies to keep certain information secret. In a democratic society, citizens rightly expect that their government is not going to keep information from them arbitrarily. And throughout our history, we have guarded uh, zealously our right to know. But there are certainly exceptions that you can think of very quickly to this principle of openness. For example, most Americans would acknowledge that tax collectors need to have access to individuals' financial uh, records, but they do not believe that their government has a right or a need to share this information openly. So let's kind of set that over here as an exception to uh, protect personal privacy. Another limited exception would certainly fall in the area of protecting national security. Our government has a responsibility to protect citizens from threats to their safety, and sometimes that requires secret operations. And in this discussion, I think if there's one point that I could convey, it is that secret operations are different than secret law. Let me repeat that again. Secret operations are different than secret law, and for obvious reasons. We've got men and women in the intelligence community who are doing important work for our country, and if their operations suddenly are all over, hither and yon, the web and, you know, and elsewhere, they can lose their lives. Our country's security can uh, be jeopardized. That is very different than the concept of our laws being kept secret because our laws, by nature of the way we write them, laws are public. And you sit at your laptop. I saw lots of students outside. They were at their laptops, and they can type away a little bit, and they can get access to a public law. And the question is, what happens when that public law is interpreted secretly? And that is what has been 
at issue. So just as I don't expect U.S. generals to publicly discuss the details of troop movements in Afghanistan any more than early Americans expected George Washington to publish his strategy for the Battle of, uh, of Yorktown, we are continuing to make the case that very often the collection of intelligence to be effective, the details have to remain uh, secret and that what are called sources and methods are in a very different kind of basket than the question of keeping uh, the law uh, secret. Uh, I was on Rachel Maddow's show last week and uh, part of the whole debate about uh, Rand Paul's you know, filibuster and she uh, picked up early on the question of the difference between secret operations and, and, and secret law and I just want to, as part of this debate, to say that I and I think many others are trying to convey that we aren't going to take a back seat to anybody, not anybody, in the question of protecting genuinely sensitive sources and operations, but I am also not going to take a back seat to anybody in the effort to try to make sure that our public laws stay public. And that is, in effect, what this discussion uh, is uh, is all about, and we could take plenty, you know, of examples of exactly what you know the consequences are. I mean, I'm also the chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Fifty percent of my state is owned by the federal government. So we care a lot about, for example, the Forest Service. If the Forest Service interprets a law in an unusual way, it is likely to become public very quickly. If the CIA or the NSA interprets a law in an unusual fashion, it might well stay secret for years. And that is what has happened in the past. If you look at the scandals of the 60s and the 70s, the spying scandals as well as Iran-Contra, the warrantless wiretapping and coercive interrogation programs of the past you know, decade, much of that narrative involves government officials secretly deciding that the law didn't mean what most people thought it meant. And in order to prevent mistakes and abuses like those from recurring, I believe the Congress and the public have to insist that the executive branch's official interpretation of the law be publicly you know, known. And I'm going to use those words, official interpretation, because we're going to have discussions about other concepts. The president and I, for example, have discussed pre-decisional you know, materials. There are a variety of other concepts here. What we have been concerned about is the executive branch's official interpretation of public laws being publicly uh, known and understood. So, with respect to the Office of Legal Counsel, as many of you know, this is a part, a unit within the Department of Justice. They provide authoritative legal advice to the President and all of the agencies in the executive branch. Now, when officials within the executive branch want to know whether a particular action would be legal, they, in effect, can rely on the uh, Office of Legal Counsel, the OLLC. And if you want to get their official interpretation of a law, Usually, you can find it contained in a written opinion from the OLC. Much of their work is public. Go to their website, you'll see new opinions are posted all the time. You can have opinions posted on firearms law, veterans benefits, and lottery tickets. And some of these publicly available opinions deal with matters of national security, including whether the president was authorized to conduct airstrikes in Libya. But there are also a number of OLC opinions that are secret and withheld not just from the public, but from the Congress uh, as well. So two years ago, I asked the Director of National Intelligence for the official legal analysis of the executive branch's you know, authority. No one reaches for water anymore now without referencing Marco Rubio. <laughs> but I will not. Two years ago, I asked the Director of National Intelligence for the official legal analysis of the executive branch's authority to, deliberate, to deliberately kill Americans in the course of counterterror operations. Now, I said on the floor, I'll say again, that 
if individual Americans choose to take up arms against the United States, there is no question in my mind that there are circumstances where the president has the authority to use military force against them. But it is also important for the president and uh, the Congress and the public to understand what the executive branch thinks the limits and boundaries of this authority you know, are. And that is the only way that you can assure that the authority is subject to appropriate limitations and uh, safeguards. And I have tried to sum this up, having talked on this a number of times, that I think every American has the right to know when their government believes it is allowed to kill them. That is, to me, where the heart of this discussion is. When I talk to people, I do, so do you believe in that principle or not? Because I think that is right at the heart of this discussion. So when I started this two-year odyssey that finally ended after seven you know, requests, I was told that um, what we wanted to know was contained in these secret opinions written by the OLC. And then we asked about them, we asked about them orally, we asked about them in, in writing. The executive branch uh, offered up summaries of their analyses, briefings on their analyses, and pretty much everything except the opinions. And eventually, having talked to my colleagues on the committee and the Brennan nomination came up before uh, the Senate, we were in a position to convince uh, a number of Senate colleagues that we absolutely had to have these opinions to fulfill our oversight you know, responsibilities. And I said, we need those opinions before there is a vote on Mr. Brennan to head uh, the CIA. And we got those uh, opinions. Now, I'm going to have more to say about the contents of the documents once we've had a little bit more time to review them. But to me, there is an important point that has been established, and that is that finally we've taken a significant step forward by establishing a precedent for applying our system of checks and balances to the challenges of warfare in the 21st century. And I think in the Senate, I sometimes talk to colleagues about the value of a checks and balances caucus, because there are a group of us, you know, Democrats and Republicans, who sort of see our role as being that, and this was a valuable precedent, a win uh, for our side. Now, my guess is some of you are saying, why did it take the executive you know, branch so long to provide these documents? What was the resistance you know, about? You just heard seven requests, a uh, two-year period, number of senators, you know, being involved. The president uh, himself saying to me and to others that he wanted to promote transparency and, and openness. My guess, having kind of walked back a little bit, you know, what happened and who said what, is that there is certainly a debate going on within the executive branch on this issue. There are some within the executive branch who simply are worried that providing the documents sets precedent that would undermine the president's ability to get uh, candid uh, legal advice. And that's why we get into this question of exactly what it is we've been looking for and sort of trying to describe the documents at issue. So to me, the president is absolutely entitled to receive confidential legal counsel, and there is no reason why the President of the United States ought to be forced to give to the Congress documents containing pre-decisional legal advice. That is very different than when the President makes a decision to take a particular action or approve a particular program, and the OLC sends a government agency a memo that explains why the decision is, is, is legal, you are no longer at that point talking about pre-decisional legal advice. It is the government's official interpretation of what the law means. It is what the law 
authorizes. It is different than sort of the prelims, the pre-decisional kinds of, uh, of questions. And I strongly believe that that legal analysis needs to be made available to the Congress and to the public because the Congress and the American people need to know what the executive branch thinks the law and the Constitution allow them to do. And I think this is especially true in the area of intelligence and national security policy where you heard me say that it is important because so much of the operations of the intelligence community have to be kept secret, that increases my interest in trying to ensure that the interpretation of the law, not the details about what they're doing in an operation, the interpretation of the law is uh, public. And I'm sure that there are some in the executive branch who are well-meaning who say that keeping official interpretations of the law uh, secret, that that is absolutely necessary because somehow if the nature of our public laws is described, that this is going to help our country's adversaries uh, figure out what the government is allowed uh, to do. The only thing is, if you buy into that kind of Alice in Wonderland logic, if the government adopts it, it would essentially mean that all sorts of laws would be secret because that would be even more useful. For example, when the Congress passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978, it would have been useful to keep the law secret from the KGB so that Soviet agents wouldn't know whether the FBI was allowed to track them. But American laws and the Constitution shouldn't be public only when the government thinks it's convenient. The laws ought to be public all the time, and every citizen ought to be able to find out what their government thinks the laws mean. And that is why your work and this discussion is so important, and um, I will just tell you what I've just stated is sort of my North Star. This has been my principle for my 12 years on the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, and this is what we try to do when we try to navigate the questions about how to balance uh, the government's need for secrecy when there are secret operations and lives at stake with the public's you know, right uh, to know. And I'm glad that you're going to help us find some more creative kinds of answers as we try to strike this balance. I mean, this balance I'm talking about can also be compared to a constitutional teeter-totter. You know, where over here you have security, over here you have, you know, liberty, and Ben Franklin and others have been debating this, you know, for years. And the system works really well if the teeter-totter can kind of stay in whack. And it's when the teeter-totter starts moving in these out-of-balance kind of gyrations, that's when I think um, our values and our liberties are particularly in jeopardy. So let me use that as kind of an opening um, salvo. I understand you have a panel and you probably want to get on with it. If anyone has a question, softball questions are always especially welcome. And um, we'll just take a question or two. We'll go right there and, yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, Sharon Bradford from the Constitution Project. Um, I want to applaud you for all this work and I fully agree with all the lines you've laid out. I'm curious to the extent that you can share with us, and maybe you can't, um, this line that you've drawn between secret operations and secret law when you're negotiating with the executive branch, are they disagreeing with that in principle, or are they arguing that when you look at these OLC opinions, they're so infected with the facts that they can't turn over the part that actually shows the law? Well, there, there's been a considerable amount of discussion about how this is somehow intertwined, that there really is no such thing as a difference between the law and the factual nature of how you describe a particular operation. I don't buy that, and I don't buy that for a second. And having read now some of these you know, materials, it's pretty clear. They involve the law. 
And I think we also have made the argument that if there is anything that would intertwine, you know, operations with the law and the law was public, that's what we have redaction for. So this is not, I, I think, the showstopper that some would want. Oh my goodness, everything is really secret operations, and we can't separate out the law from the you know secret you know operations. Um, we've got another example in terms of what we've read that shows that can be done. Yeah. Um, Laura Jakes with Associated Press. So just to kind of piggyback on that, what has been the legal standard heretofore of uh, the government being allowed to kill Americans? Uh, you're smiling. But if, there, if, if, this, if the OLC memos are rooted in law, what is that law? Well, what the questions have been all about is the Congress is really kind of in the dark on that point. And I'm going to be asking some additional questions now, having had a chance to at least go through the documents once. Were you at the Brennan hearing? No, but I was at the hearing yesterday. So. OK. So what I do, especially when we get one of those rare creatures known as an open hearing, I try to do everything I can to try to excavate details with respect to how we would answer your question. For example, when Mr. Brennan was there for the hearing, I asked him about the definition uh, essential to uh, what kind of evidentiary standard would be relevant. And when I tell you about the questions, I'll tell you what, what he said. I asked questions with respect to capture and surrender. And, everything I could think of that would allow me to get more detail about exactly what the government is doing. And I thought the answers were exceptionally vague. I mean, my favorite one was the response, it was a long response where he said in one sentence, we are optimizing secrecy and we are optimizing uh, transparency in the same sentence. <laughs> He, I mean, just let me just finish. The particularly detailed focus that I had that day where I just went at it and went at it and went at it was we still do not have a public accounting of what country's lethal force has been used. And so I asked at the hearing, I asked it repeatedly at the hearing, and finally he said, well, Senator, you can be sure if I'm confirmed I'll tell you if there's any country where lethal force is used, which of course was not you know, the question. So what I try to do, and I did it again yesterday with respect to two questions, the statement that had been made by the National Security Advisor General Alexander with respect to something I'd never heard used before, the question of dossiers, and I asked exactly what they meant, and then um, we'll be asking more questions with respect to the warrants that the Intelligence Committee uses or you know, doesn't use. And I pointed out that FISA doesn't specify a warrant. And I was particularly struck what was noteworthy about yesterday, and I'm not sure I have seen all the papers and wire services and all the rest, but I thought the Attorney General's response on that was particularly telling because he said the courts are going to interpret what the warrant requirements are and evidence or there are circumstances where neither is required. And I think you heard me say, well, I think that's right. What are people going to do about their rights while we're waiting for the courts to flush it you know, out? So I've got a lot more to do in terms of just staying at it. But the reason I keep asking all these questions is because the answers are so vague and inadequate, and you know we, you know we win battles, and we've won a couple of really big ones here in the last year. I think didn't get quite as much attention um, at the end of the year, but um, you all might have, might have reported on it. I had put a hold on the intelligence authorization bill because of these provisions that were supposed to be fighting leaks and. Most of what, what they did was damage the public's right to know. Nobody thought we had a chance on that. And because we spent 
the better part of six months trying to lay out the consequences. We won a complete victory on it. They were all removed. So we won that, and we won the effort to get the, you know, OLC, you know, documents. But I'm convinced that I'll let you follow up. We got a lot more to do to be able to tell someone like yourself and to tell Americans, here's the evidentiary standard, here are the rules with respect you know, to capture, here are the countries where lethal force, and I'm just going to keep asking the questions and pressing the case until we get it. So, okay, go ahead. so just very quickly, I mean, if, if, if you're Joe American or a law student Susie and you're a student Susie and you want to look at Title 18 or, or whatever, see what exactly the law says, there is really nothing in there at this point. Correct. There's no legal standard that says, one clear legal standard that says this is the case in which the government can kill an American. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that is, that is why, I mean, clearly the question I asked in the committee with respect to geographic, you know, limitations and you know, the ability to use lethal force in the United States. We know a bit more now than we did two weeks ago. The, the line has sort of been vaguely articulated that if you're talking about a non-combatant in the United you know, States, that is different, for example, than uh, the question of trying to deal with an imminent threat along the lines of 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. But I will just tell you, I think this debate is just beginning in terms of trying to actually answer the question you have asked. You've said, where does an American go to actually see what the standard is? And the answer you know, is that that has not you know, been laid out. And in fact, I thought a number of the responses to questions that I asked, particularly at the Brennan hearing, when I was trying to get the administration on record on, on that point, were so vague, and particularly that sentence, and you can get it out of the transcript, where they said in the same sentence, we're going to maximize transparency and maximize secrecy as their, as their response to make it clear that the answer to the question, which is the way I frame it, that Americans have a right to know when their government believes it's allowed to kill them. We got a long way to go to have that question answered. I can see that we could have had a whole program with the senator, and I regret that we don't have the time because we have two great panels lined up. But I think you've offered some really insightful comments and a great way to sort of start our conversation. So I very much appreciate you joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having me.